Nayaji, thank you for joining us today as we look at some social issues. As you know, last week we had an anti-drug activist. We've talked about welfare cutbacks and gambling. And today we're going to talk about trafficking in women. There's going to be an international conference in Victoria. There are many women who get lured and tricked into the sex trade. And there are some testimonials that have been put together for this show. The testimonials are quite disturbing. Why don't we take a look? When I first arrived at a nightclub, I was told to serve drinks, just that. Then the next day, he told me I had to be a stripper. I couldn't do it. How could I do it? The agreement in Indonesia was just to sit with people while they had their drinks. He said if I didn't do it, I wouldn't get any money. On the first day, it was just looking on as it were getting to know everything and then I knew exactly what sort of work it really was and that what they had told us in Poland was one big lie. The way Johan stared at you made it clear that you had to go. There was no way out of it because you wouldn't get any money or anything. And the way he stared, there was no question of not going if a client chose you. You had to go and that was that. Even if you cried, you still had to go because that's what the client wanted. When I first arrived in Greece, I thought I was going to work as a waitress. But my work turned out to be quite different because they forced me to have sex with men against my will. I said I wouldn't and start crying. Then they said that if I didn't have sex with that man, I'd be sent back to Santo Domingo without a penny. I'd be deported. For the moment we have two Polish girls, one Romanian girl. They have passports, but they have no working permits. So we're going to put them in jail and normally they will be expelled and repatriated. He told me that I simply had to do it, so we got into an argument about it. He even slapped me. I had no choice. I held out for five days, crying, with no food. But then I thought that since I was there, I might as well make a go of it. A man came looking for me, and I lost my honor and my virginity for $25. It's important for us to know that trafficking in women does happen in Canada. The Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women estimates 50% of women in prostitution in this country were trafficked into the sex trade. Canada has special artists' visas for exotic dancers that don't require a contract from the sponsoring employer. Many women from Eastern European countries are attracted to this. When they arrive here, they are forced into the sex trade. Unsuspecting Canadian women are trafficked out of our country. They answer advertisements to work in karaoke bars in Japan. They end up in the sex trade in Japan or Latin America. Sometimes they are attracted to jobs in Hawaii and get sent to Japan. Just how much money is there in this? There's a lot. It's estimated that in the past 10 years, 30 million women have been sent into slavery conditions. Profits earned by their exploiters beat money made from selling arms and almost match money made worldwide in the drug trade. Besides, the sex trade and women are sold the sex trade women are sold into marriages where the husband has the power of an owner. Physical and sexual treats are common as are threats of violence. The woman has no control over the number of children she has and is often threatened with the loss of her children if she complains. And then there's the trade in domestic workers. After they arrive at their jobs, they're hit with an array of fees and costs which establish a debt, bondage they can't get out of. Passports and identity papers are taken away and they often work under conditions where no labor laws apply. This is something obviously that we'll have to get up to speed on. It's happening in Canada. It affects women and children. It's an international issue. We'll be back after a break with two guests and your calls. Tayabshi is brought to you in part by CFAX 1070, Victoria's news authority. This, this is a neon from Chrysler. My neon, and I like it. Sure, it's got a two liter engine, automatic transmission, dual airbags, air conditioning, and a ton more. All for a really great lease. It's zero down, freight and tax included. You just drive it away. You know what, a neon is more than just a car. It's like a friend. I got mine at a local BC Chrysler dealer. The Neon. You want companionship? Get a dog. You want companionship and AM FM stereo? Get a Neon. 
Catherine and her nanny. Pillsbury Toaster Strudel, a warm, flaky snack with juicy filling and do-it-yourself icing. Kids will do anything for a toaster strudel. Now available in cream cheese and fruit combinations. A window of opportunity is being opened by the craftsmanship of Macmillan Bloedel. Using the latest technology, we're maximizing the use of exquisite fine grain lumber for high quality tilt and turn windows and doors. Even waste wood is recycled on site for heating and drying window and door components. The final result is superb workmanship, innovative design, and a breath of fresh air for Canada's economy. Macmillan Bloedel, making the most of a renewable resource. Do you find yourself being blinded in broad daylight? Inspired by the anatomy of the eagle's eye, introducing Eagle Eyes Polarized Sunglasses. Eagle Eyes cut down excessive brightness while blocking out harmful UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. They're perfect for all your leisure activities, in the winter and the summer, too. Just try Eagle Eyes once, and you'll see that the choice is clear. Eagle Eyes Advanced Polarized Sunglasses come with this practical aluminum case. Eagle Eyes. Seeing is believing. The Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women is meeting this week in Victoria and they are trying to deal with an international trade in women where women are tricked, trapped and sold into the sex trade. It's happening in Canada. Roughly 50% of prostitutes may have come from this and we're joined today by two guests, first from the University of Victoria, the Women's Studies Department, Jyoti Sangara. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah. And also Marian Wires. Is that correct? correct? And you're from yes. Holland? I'm from Holland, and from yes. Foundation Against Trafficking in Women. Okay, and you're here for the conference, I guess, too? Yes, I am. Okay, I guess I'll start from, a, I mean, most people, I have to tell you, I didn't know anything about this to start off with. First of all, I didn't think that it was still happening in this day and age, that you could actually sell people and trade in people. We see from the stats that it's more than the arms trade, almost as much as the drugs trade. Um, how many women who are, uh, you know, right now trying to get out of prostitution may have come from that and have other obstacles as well? I guess I should ask you this, Jyoti, for example, dealing with the immigration authorities. What happens if a woman is suddenly lands in Canada and says, uh, this isn't a nanny position that I thought it was going to be? Well, you know, um, the point is we have to look at both the conditions from where they're coming and and then the conditions that they get into. Right. But um, I think it's important to first point out that there are two aspects to, to this trafficking. One is the actual recruitment and transportation of the workers, right. uh, for indeed they are migrating and traveling as workers. Um, the second aspect is the conditions under which they work. Um, and both of these are covered by the rubric trafficking. Now, I think um, a lot of the women may migrate of their own volition, voluntarily, whether they're East European women or women who come here as nannies. They want work, they seek work, which is why they come here. They could be getting out of a bad situation in their home country. That too, yes, mm. that too, or that there is no work there. You know, globalization right. has done this in the world. So they voluntarily travel to find work, and people have always done that. I mean, I've traveled from India, sure. and, and our ancestors have. But um, it's the conditions of work which then they get stuck into where they are controlled or they don't have full control over their lives. And I think here the gaps are in terms of state policy and immigration. Um, I think there's very much there, very little there to address the interests of the women. But couldn't you, if you find yourself in this situation, couldn't you go to the police and say, look, um, I was <coughs> told that this is supposed to be a legitimate job and instead they're trying to force me to, um, into the sex trade. Why wouldn't they yeah. do that? Uh, well, they do do that. But the point is that not all of them do that because the onus is on the, on the employee, the woman, to do that and her legal status here is so fragile. When she arrives here, um, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't have permanent residency for at least two years of being here and if she gets a bad record from her employer she is under the threat of being her services being terminated mm -hmm. and she is then threatened that she would be deported and sent back to the same conditions that she tried to escape so the, with the onus being on the woman to report her abuse 
puts her in a very fragile situation. I think the state should take authority, uh, should take responsibility for this. Um, employment, citizen, and immigration Canada should be much more uh, proactive on this. But how would they do that? And I guess what, uh, let me first mm -hmm. start by saying, uh, Marianne, you're from Holland. They yes. have a very different uh, situation with respect mm -hmm. to prostitution there, mm -hmm. and there have frequently been debates uh, that maybe in Canada we should decriminalize prostitution so that you don't end up with, um, you know, it suddenly being a criminal offense to come forward and say this is what I've been forced to do. Yeah. Do you think that's an obstacle to, to changing the situation? Well, the, the current prostitution laws are of course an obstacle for women because the women are outlawed, they are criminalized, they are marginalized. So how can you come forward and tell I'm abused right. if, if you're the one who, who is marginalized and who did wrong? So prostitution laws and recognized prostitution as work and protect women by labor laws that would be an important step forwards to protect women from abuse. But if we look at trafficking, a very simple step forwards would be not to deport the women when they uh, report the abuse. And that has been practice and is practice in most countries. So if women go to the police, go to the authorities and report the abuse, what will happen to them is that they will be deported, What means that they will never do that it will be very difficult for them to go back to their own country and yeah. it will be impossible to prosecute uh, the offenders. I'm just wondering though if that's uh, going to be realistic when you think about uh, the way we've been doing things in Canada for so long. If you decriminalize prostitution, which a lot of people would say, well maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not, but if you work to certain labor standards, couldn't people still continue to scam it and pretend that you know, they're putting out legitimate job contracts in other countries and still be bringing women in and I mean there's always a way to get around the system. Um, if the issue is to stop the trafficking in women, don't you have to go to the source and go to the people who are doing this? Can't they trace those people? Yes, but one of the reasons why traffickers can operate like this is because the women are not protected by law. They are not protected as migrants, not as women, and not as women working in prostitution or as domestics. Oh, I so you make it very easy country. for traffickers then. Okay, okay we're going to take some calls now, and uh, you can call in one triple eight. 3836036 and a reminder don't forget to press the one first. We'll start with Ken uh, from the Malahat. Hi Ken. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if any study had been done uh, regarding the exploitation of women. Uh, is it being done uh, primarily by first generation Canadians, newly arrived uh, immigrants, or first gen uh, for, let's see. Did I say first generation Canadians? Yeah, I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Is, it, is it people who are, are... Are they preying on their own kind, in other words, uh, um, Europeans that have arrived here in more recent years, um, being forceful with, say, newly arrived European women, that mm -hmm. um, they, they kind of exploit them because they know what's happening in Europe and they have a way of, of um, coercing them or getting around them as opposed to mm -hmm. being uh, pressured by, say... Um, second or third generation okay. Canadians. So. Okay, thanks Ken. That's an interesting what he's saying is, is it people who are newly arrived here saying, I know how bad it is back there, maybe I can just reel in a few naive young women and, and make some money. I guess I'll start with you. Sangha, are you originally from, um, Yoti, Yoti, you're originally from India, yes, so you may right. have some knowledge of some of that happening. Well, you know, no, it, it isn't so simple that uh, people who are newly arrived are the ones who are sort of um, uh, running these, um, these international rackets. It is indeed very much organized and it's very international. So it's like an international drug cartel it or is, something? Yeah, it is. And, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of overlap between an international drug ca cartel and, and people who are, who are doing this trafficking. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised by that. Once you know how to get around a system one way or the other. Yeah, well, you've, mm -hmm. you've already made Diversify. these Diversify. Conduits of networking, diversify, and yeah. go into products which are um, more profitable. And universally uh, popular, I guess. Let's start. We have Paige in Vancouver. Paige, you're with a prostitution counseling uh, organization? Yes, I am. I'm the founder of an organization called PACE, Prostitution Alternatives Counseling and Education. Okay. We're a federal charitable society that help people get off the street. Okay. And I, I think there's a couple things missing here. I agree with what these women are saying. It is often an issue of poverty or an issue of immigration. But the average age of entry globally is 13 years old. Wow. Um, three quarters to 95% of us have been sexually abused as children. I am myself a former prostitute. Um, it's our government that's not protecting our children is the main issue. When you take a look at the, the incidence of sexual abuse and the lack of options, of job options for, for youth as well as for women, 
and there seems to be this impression that uh, even if you're, okay, the average age of entry is 13, in Canada it's about 15, depending on which study you read. So uh, if you enter at 15, like I did, there's the perception that all of a sudden at age 19 you're going to be able to have the life skills, the coping skills, and the job skills to go and get a job right. like any other job, right? It's not like any other job. Uh, we're murdered at a rate of 120 times that of a normal woman. Wow. Okay. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a normal job. It's okay. not a career we're talking about. It's, it's it's like self-sexual abuse when you take a look at the average age of entry. Okay, thanks for your call, Paige. Um, she's raised a lot of uh, very interesting points. I mean, at shockingly young age, 13, 15 years old, um, that would be a very intimidating environment to be in. I mean, suddenly you're in a new country, you may not even speak the language. I guess, is that something that you find you've been involved in international conferences as well? Well, if I look at Europe, or especially at Holland, then most of our clients are 16, 17, up to 25, and I don't have experience with children that young who were trafficked, uh, trafficked into Holland. And I, I do think that um, you need different strategies if we are talking about children and trafficking in children mm -hmm. than when we are talking about trafficking in adults, adult women. But I think it's also important to to reinforce the point that um, the speaker made, um, the w woman who called, that now we are talking about two aspects here. One is women trafficked into Canada from right. developing countries and their age may not be that low. Uh, we'd say about 17 to 25. Still, women. that's very young. Yes, but, but in Canada itself, what, which is what she pointed out, then women are, or young girls are entering at the age of 13 or 15 and there is internal trafficking going on here and within the North American region so I think we need to, to highlight, highlight these two aspects, that it is okay. going on here and then there are women coming from outside. And it's only in relation to women from outside that we can talk about immigration, but we certainly sure. need to address the laws here and okay. prostitution laws here. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be back after a quick break with more of your calls. We're talking about traffic in women. Tayabshi is brought to you in part by Metro, Lexus, Toyota, Victoria, and Duncan. You love cooking, but you're fed up with mixing, whipping, and beating ingredients. Introducing the amazing Maxi Mixer Plus. The multi-beater mixes all kinds of dough. The whisks whip up delicious milkshakes, and the mixers make it easy to prepare sauces and omelets. The three-bladed attachment offered free of charge converts the Maxi Mixer Plus into a chopper. The Maxi Mixer Plus comes with all these accessories and the premium chopper. To prepare mouth-watering dishes, get yourself the Maxi Mixer Plus. Some tires are best for winter, others for wet weather, or comfort, or durability. Now Michelin gives you the best all-season tire for winter, the best for wet weather, the most comfortable, and one guaranteed for six years unlimited mileage. Best of all, it's one tire. Michelin's X1, the biggest revolution in tires ever. I consider naming him Nightmare or Trouble, but I settle on cash, because uh, that's what he's cost me. Thousands of dollars in damage. I've got a line of credit, so I'm able to fix and replace everything. As for Cash, he's, uh, he's in obedience school. I think we've got the problem licked now. You know the hardest part about moving to a new radio station after 29 years? Trying to remember the new call letters. AM 900, Victoria's Information Superstation. Sure, it's easy for you. All you have to do is remember to turn your radio dial to AM 900. But I have to remember those call letters every time I open the mic. AM 900. AM Unforgettable 900. Barry Bowman. Mornings on AM 900. AM 900. I'm Bo Berryman. Talking about international traffic in women, uh, there's a conference that's starting in Victoria. It will be moving to Vancouver. We'll go straight to the lines and start with Karinza in Vancouver. Hi, Karinza. Hi, uh, Piaggi. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, I had a question and a comment 
the first, the question was, what happens to the importers? Because you know these women are being treated as a commodity. Right. Uh, are there no laws? And the comment was, um, most the majority of sex trade buyers, if not all, are male. Mm-hmm. And I'm don't I'm not male bashing, but uh, you know I think it it has a lot to do with the lack of political power. That oh, women have. Interesting comment, especially during a federal election. Um, so what, what do happen to importers of this commodity, these women? I mean, if they're caught? I guess maybe start mm-hmm. with you, Marianne. Yeah. Well, one of the problems uh, to prosecute traffickers is the fact that the, the victims are right away deported so that they can't testify. Uh, testify. But do they fall under international law or does it have to come within a country's law? No, it's national law who decides uh, about it. Um, for instance, one of our first um, actions in Holland was to uh, put it on a political agenda and campaign for a temporary staying permit for women so that they had the time to think about their life and reorganize their lives and that they were enabled to, to press charges and to act as a witness. Mm-hmm. And that's really the first, first basic step you have to make if you want to address the issue. Okay. Let's now talk to Rina in Vancouver. Hi, Rina. Oh, hello. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I was uh, referring to Ms. Sangara's comments. She mm-hmm. said that the government should get into this, and I seem to agree with that wholeheartedly because uh, obviously these employees uh, call um, uh, sponsor these girls from overseas. Right. They misrepresent the whole thing. They right. come into the country, and then they're left on loose ends. Why doesn't the government or the immigration get behind these employees, see that they, uh, they represent the thing correctly, right. the employment correctly, and also, if I, I may be wrong, but I, I was under the impression that there was a law that they were to keep these girls for a minimum of three years, they're entitled to education while they're, they're in the country, like every weekend or something. I, I don't know all the details of that, okay. but we have not come across that anymore. All right, I don't know anything about that last aspect. It doesn't sound like there is a program like that, but um, it, it, it does make sense that if they're advertising and if they're involved in some kind of business, that there would be, even if the woman isn't here to testify, you can see that there's no domestic work going on. Well, you know, very often uh, the sites are so isolated, even in domestic work, for instance, if, if you know, there's a family that's taking on a nanny, who's going to go and look into the house and find out what's happening? And even if she is a live-in caregiver, Mm -hmm. the point is that there are certain rules under which she has to work. Eight hours a day, she needs a proper room to stay. And, you know, there are conditions. There should be labor standards. So there should be labor standards that are governing that work. And on the surface of it, um, the, you know, immigration citizenship says there are labor standards. But who is going to report when they are violated? It's the woman. And she very often is in a new country, has very little knowledge about her rights, doesn't know where to go, sure. what to do, and you know, so it just remains at that level. Okay. Let's talk to Arnold now in Vancouver. Hi, Arnold, go ahead. Uh, hi, I just had a couple of really quick questions. Uh, first one is, uh, I know like locally in our newspaper here, we have advertisements sometimes for uh, uh, women to uh, work, you know, wherever in foreign countries uh, doing things like that, right. this and that. I was just wondering if it's possible to uh, filter out, or how do we know, like, if any of these are legit, or do we assume that all of them are mm-hmm. uh, methods to kind of lure people into that? Or okay, well, that's a good question. Um, how do we know if an adver- advertisement is is legitimate? I mean, how do you make sure that when you're phoning that it says, you know, we want an English tutor overseas, that you're not going to end up stuck in one of these trades? I think what we need to do is really do a very uh, wide scale educational around this and to make the women aware whoever is going um, that you know these are the possibilities that we have come across cases where women have been pushed into doing work which was not legitimate work or which was work they were coerced into so there are these possibilities. Does the Immigration Bureau have some sort of list or anything like that? It doesn't have any list and I mm-hmm. think those are some of the things we need to press well, for that just be the sort very of least. manuals yeah. for migrant women to sure. inform them and once they go to the country um, organizations they can get in touch with, just phone numbers and, you know, women's groups that they can contact in case of abuse. Okay. Let's talk to Ron in Souk. Hi, Ron. Hi. What I uh, was thinking is that there hasn't been any discussion so far about the, uh, about how to deal with the people who are trafficking in women when they're caught. 
Right. It seems to me like the, uh, the, the way we understand this and what we see from the media is that these people have very expensive cars, lots of jewelry, and spend uh, vast quantities of money mm-hmm. bouncing around uh, right. to attract these women. Uh, when these people are caught and prosecuted, uh, why wouldn't we remove all of those trapments and use the proceeds to uh, help with the women's programs to rehabilitate these women and also to pay offset the costs of, of prosecution. Well, that's an outstanding idea. I mean, the proceeds of crime, it should go back into that. And not only that, he's right. We all know who they are. I mean, if you follow these things, you can find the people in the neighborhood who are driving cars that are way too expensive for what they're doing. So, I mean, you'd figure that there could be a, a trail you could follow. Is that part of what the conference is about in the next few weeks? Well, certainly. We'll be coming up with strategies and recommendations for you know, public. Well, I think you've got a couple NG- of good ones. <laughs> yes, very good ones <laughs> yeah. for NGOs and then for the government. So the NGO being non-governmental organizations. Non-governmental organizations, grassroots organizations sure. who are addressing the issue. Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing because there's so much to cover here. And the fact that you said there's overlap between the different uh, organizations yeah. means it should be even easier to track them down. Yeah. Well, I wish you both well. Thank you very much for joining us. We've been Thank talking you. to Jyoti Sangara and Marianne Wires. Okay. I see I should get an A for pronunciation anyway. <laughs> and good luck with your conference. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And we'll be back after a quick break with my opinion. In a recent poll of Canadians' favorite foods, hot homemade bread was second only to chicken. We'd like to point out that the majority of those polled couldn't have tried bread made with new Robin Hood Best for Bread flour, because our softer, higher-rising bread would have pounded chicken into a second-rate schnitzel. Robin Hood Best for Bread flour, ideal for bread machines and scratch. You love cooking, but you're fed up with mixing, whipping, and beating ingredients. Introducing the amazing Maxi Mixer Plus. The multi-beater mixes all kinds of dough. The whisks whip up delicious milkshakes, and the mixers make it easy to prepare sauces and omelets. The three-bladed attachment offered free of charge converts the Maxi Mixer Plus into a chopper. The Maxi Mixer Plus comes with all these accessories and the premium chopper. To prepare mouth-watering dishes, get yourself the Maxi Mixer Plus. The next generation is here. It's called Pacifica. New lightweight coated paper. A unique combination of technologies developed by Macmillan Blodell Research. Lighter, more efficient use of wood. Creating bright, easy to read magazines and catalogs for you. And delivering the benefits of technology to our customers. Macmillan Blodell, making the most of a renewable resource. We're at Dave Wheaton Pontiac Buick talking to more real people. What should people know about used vehicles at Dave Wheaton? We have a 60-point inspection on all used vehicles. We have a uh, 30-day powertrain, and we have 15% off parts and labor. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far to say I sold more cars than anybody else, but uh, through the years, uh, after being here for 14 years and being in the car business for 25 years, uh, you do get to meet a lot of people. Dave Wheaton Pontiac Buick. Real people, real close by. Come see for yourself. Well, we've been waiting for it, and sure enough, we are into a federal election campaign. Only three and a half years into the mandate, Jean Chrétien is looking for another term. Let's see what happens. We're going to start talking about it tomorrow with our political pundits. Over the next few weeks, we'll be following the federal election from an issue-based perspective. I think today we talked about an issue that has a lot of relevance to the election campaign. Sometimes I wonder what we're paying our taxes for. We have these huge bureaucracies back in Ottawa, but they don't seem to be able to deal with things that any group of us in our own neighborhoods could point out and probably deal with. Some of the callers had some excellent suggestions. Let's take the proceeds of crime and use that to make sure that there are support services for people affected. Let's also make sure that when we see ads for overseas jobs that we check out with our local women's groups, check out with the immigration office, find out if they're legitimate. But most of all, let's monitor what's going on in our, on in our communities because we can probably find some of the people affected. And let's do our part. I'm Judy Tayabji and that's my opinion. What's yours? <laughs>